Well, today we're going to talk a bit about uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. I'm going to go through the first five verses. Finally, brethren, so you can see that he's a typical preacher. He's trying to get to the end. And you know that when a preacher says in conclusion, it means absolutely nothing. So he says, finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified just as it is with you that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for not all have faith. So just, I want to break out some of these ideas or thoughts that he's giving these people. One, of course, is the fact that he's treating them with such kindness, like family. Finally, brethren, there's a tenderness that in his heart toward them. Uh, the church in Thessalonica was prior to his work in Corinth and his work in Athens and all these other places. So this region of Achaia in which Thessalonica is one of the cities, he has great tenderness there because that's where he first really ministered in that region and the gospel took hold and these people believed and God changed their lives and he uh, has a great affection toward them because of that. So he's asking them to pray for him and I, I thought about prayer in the, in the context of the, of the language, if you read about that, uh, and, and I'm not an expert in these languages by any stretch. I read people who are. <laughs> Try to make me sound smart. But it really means to keep on praying. Just like often when, when Jesus said, ask, seek, and knock, it's keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. Some people like to say that if you have enough faith, you just pray once. No. If you have faith, you keep on praying. It's not an expression of great faith to just pray once and then quit. The Bible clearly says we should persevere. Keep on seeking and asking and knocking. Keep on praying. And why does he want them to pray? Well, a lot of reasons. Uh, one is I want to just remind us of some simple facts about prayer. In prayer, there's no distance. You can pray for people halfway around the world. For someone who's lonely, a long ways away, they can find comfort in prayer. They go to the throne of grace. You go to the throne of grace. There's just something about the comfort of the Spirit that happens in prayer that doesn't happen any other way. You and I pray we have great power at our disposal. We're releasing the kingdom of God to go somewhere where you can't. God is not bound or limited in any way, and when we pray, our prayers are not limited or bound in any way. There's no class difference. There's no spiritual people and unspiritual people. Paul would be, if you're going to classify believers, Paul would be in the upper echelon, wouldn't he? But he's desiring the prayers of even these young believers. He's desiring them to pray for him. Why? Because he knows that prayer works. Prayer does something. So nobody should be above the need to have someone else pray for them. There's no class difference. Everybody needs prayer, especially ministers need prayer. So uh, I'm sure you understand this. Is sometimes preachers are on the front lines of, of um, what should I say, the assault of the church on the gates of hell. Jesus said, the gates of hell, in other words, those who sit at the seat of authority, shall not withhold or hold back the push of the church. Those who proclaim the gospel, whether in word, song, or personal witness, testimony, those people are on the front lines, and you have adversaries, and prayer pushes them back. The Word of God has power. It's like a battering ram. It comes and crashes against the mentality of the world, the stubbornness, the vileness, the rebellion, the defiance of the world. By the way, all those things, evil, wickedness, defiance, rebellion, all those are hatched in hell. And those who let those things express themselves through their personality are agents of hell. So we don't come against those people as they're from hell. We come against those expressions of hell with great kindness and love, but understanding the confidence and the power that we have through prayer. So when we pray, when we declare the gospel, we know that something is happening. It isn't ineffective. It is powerful. And certainly every minister needs prayer. I need your prayer. I hope you pray for me. I pray for you. And if I find out you're not praying for me, you're out of here. No, just kidding. <laughs> we pray one for another, do we not? And uh, when we do that, we strengthen people. We don't even know where that strength comes from. Well, it comes from prayer. When you pray, you're strengthened. When you pray for others, they are strengthened. It's an incredible thing. I just want to encourage you again to be people who pray. 
And what does he ask? That the word of the Lord may run swiftly, unhindered, unbound, unfettered. I suspect this imagery comes from his experience and knowledge of what happens in the stadium or the Colosseum, those athletic games. May the word of the Lord run swiftly as an athlete, powerful, getting there, headed to where it's supposed to go. I found this verse in the Old Testament, in the New King James Version. Psalm 147 and 15, he sends out his command to the earth, and his word runs very swiftly. God's word is not bound by any limitations. God decrees it, declares it, it will be so. Now, I know you can think of an exception uh, because of unbelief. Jesus didn't do many mighty works there. I, I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking when God declares something, it will be as he said. It will be exactly as he said in the timing that he said. Uh, when Paul was praying, his concern, of course, was the gospel's success. I, I, what he didn't pray for was his own daily bread, his own provision. He wasn't even concerned really about protection, but he was asking for deliverance from unreasonable and ungodly men, not protection from them, but deliverance from them. I read the other day, somebody else should get the credit for this. I didn't think of it. I stole it. I don't know who to give credit to, but the next click. God did not remove the Red Sea. He parted it. They had to go through it. Sometimes God lets you face things that you need to go through. Why? Because you need to see his delivering work. We would rather God would just eliminate all difficulties, all trials, all obstacles, and you could have smooth sailing. Wouldn't that be nice? It's not how it works, is it? Life, real life, happens to all of us. We're real people. Just because we're believers doesn't mean you're immune from life. Bad things happen. People break into your house, steal stuff. People have accidents, wrecks, sickness. People die. We, we have life, but we go through things victoriously rather than succumbing to the circumstances, giving up and cashing in your chips. That's not how it works. Those who oppose the gospel are, in fact, unreasonable and wicked. The gospel is reasonable. It's rational. Those who do not believe that is the exact description. They do not believe. Do is an act of will. They do not believe. Could believe. Some do. Some will not. Some do not. Anyone can. You and I have the freedom to choose to believe or not. Was there a time in your life when you did not Tony, what changed? She threatened to kill you? <laughs> How is it that suddenly your mind gets changed? Anybody want to take a second and tell me what happened? Ken, what happened? No, 
experience in the car? Oh, the experience in the car. I was probably uh, in my 40s, early 40s. But it was something I couldn't deny. But it was, uh, there's a lot of things that changed <laughs> my life, as we have talked about. This is just one way out. L listen, God can change a man's mind, change his life. And when that happens, you change the destiny of some people not even born yet, grandchildren. God has destiny wrapped up in our decisions. The gospel is powerful. Speak the word. Teach the word. Preach the word. Now, your personal testimony has a powerful impact, and you share what Christ did for you, how it changed you. That's powerful. But it's the word of God which is quick and active. In other words, alive, sharper than even any two-edged sword piercing and dividing asunder the thoughts and the intents of the heart, the bone from the marrow. Anybody looked in the middle of a bone? The marrow's in the middle and it just kind of fades into the bone. The sword of God's word by his spirit can directly divide, precisely divide. You show you light from darkness, right from wrong. Not that you don't know light, right from wrong and light from darkness. You know you're just not willing to believe. And suddenly, you have the ability to believe. And the point I'm making is, some will believe and some will not. There was a long season when you chose to ignore. I don't know that you didn't believe, you just chose to ignore. But one day, God got your full attention. One day, God got your full attention. One day, all of us, God got our full attention. Paul is the only one I know that was born saved. And went downhill from there. <laughs> uh, no, I give Paul a bad time. Uh, I, I wish all of you could get to know our brother Paul. He is rock solid, as are many of you. And I appreciate that about you all so much that uh, if I were not here and somebody was to come in and preach something not true, all of you have such wisdom and the discerning that you could say, mm, don't think so. You will not be led astray because you're a people of the word. But you and I know that not everyone is receptive to the gospel. Sometimes there's opposition. Sometimes we were that opposition. But God has changed our lives. Verse 3, but the Lord is faithful who will establish you and guard you from the evil one give you a few scriptures here about God being faithful. I've got two out of Psalm 119. All your commands are trustworthy. Verse 138 of Psalm 119. Your laws are perfect and completely trustworthy. Deuteronomy 7. Understand, therefore, that the Lord your God is indeed God. He is the faithful God who keeps his covenant for a thousand generations and lavishes his unfailing love on those who love him and obey his commands. You know, if you're walking with God, it's going to be pretty hard for you to outrun the love of God. The Bible says that the blessings of the Lord will overtake you. Overtake you. You cannot run him. God will hunt you down and bless you. If you ever received a blessing from the Lord, you go, where did that come from? How did I deserve that? Wow. Sometimes you just stop and consider, Lord, you've been so good to me. You've been so good to me. Isaiah 25, verse 1. O oh Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name, for you have done wonderful things. Your counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. Boy, the Old Testament has so many wonderful things to say about the goodness of God. And then the word establish. God is faithful. He will establish you. Romans 16, 25. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began. Isn't it interesting how that God had this plan of salvation, redemption, wrapped up from the very beginning? And now when you look back and read the Genesis account, you see that it was in the mind of God from the get-go. That's not a Bible word. That's southern. From the get-go. 
God, from even before time began, had this worked out, that he would give mankind freedom to choose. He would allow evil to come into play, because if there were no evil, how could we know God's mercy and his grace and his justice? There are those shallow thinkers who like to claim because there's evil in the world, God created it, and therefore God can't be God. Uh, you are a faulty in your thinking, O oh brilliant one. God allows man to have free will, and because man rebelled, those other things flourished so that God's redemption plan could unfold. And you and I could enjoy and, and receive the redemption, the work of Christ, and the mind of God, the wisdom of God. The Bible says in Ephesians that God chose from before the foundation of the world to prove to the prince and powers that be his great wisdom in redeeming the church made out of you and me, the rebellious mankind that he created for the purpose of loving him. He let us go our own way. And then when we were redeemed, God basically says to the demonic powers, neener, neener, neener. I had this all down from the beginning. You rebelled and you do not participate in the wonderful glories of my creation and all eternity cut to come. But these, the fallen ones, I have redeemed and they are mine and they are my people. And they will live with me forever while you will languish in change of darkness, according to Jude. Those fallen angels will never see the glories of God that they forsook. Man, on the other hand, forsook his glorious beginnings and fell, but God has redeemed us. Wow, we should be so grateful. We should be so thankful. So when you understand that God has chosen us, redeemed us, loved us to himself, man, how can you not but respond in kind? It isn't about rules and how right you live. Oh, sure it is, but it's not. It is, but it's not. God just loves you. Love him back. And when you love him back, you're going to be surprised how your life cleans up and how it changes. You never focus on the rules. Focus on the one who loves you. Love him in return. Your life will get clean. You remember back when we were in 1 Thessalonians a few weeks ago, this word uh, 313 of 1 Thessalonians, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. God is coming with Christ, all of his saints, and you will be established. 1 Peter 5.10. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. Anybody got a black highlighter? I want to take this phrase out of my Bible. After you have suffered a while. Does that need to be in there? After you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. God is working in your life. The word guard will guard you from the evil one. In the Greek, it means, as you might expect, to watch, to guard, to keep. I looked it up in the Hebrew. There are three words which are translated guard. I want to give you those three meanings because to me it unfolded another whole thing I hadn't considered. So um, the first meaning, or the first word that's translated guard, the word describes the runners who were in front of the king's chariot. And those runners would actually form a military guard and protect the king who was coming along in his chariot. Let me give you an illustration. Second Samuel 15, 1. After this had happened, that Absalom provided himself with chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him. Do you know who Absalom was? A son of David had beautiful long black hair like Paul. Boy, it's fun to pick on you, Paul. Well, especially with all that hair. Paul's head reminds me of heaven. No parting there. I'll pay you later for all that abuse. So, so the first meaning is these runners. The second meeting, uh, butchering fell in most eastern countries to the cook, and therefore this word gained a secondary sense of executioner. So there are the people who run before. There's also executioners. And then the third meaning was to watch or those who do the watching. So here's what I want us to gather here. God will guard you. We pray that God will guard you, that God will run before you. 
God will be a military guard of protection for you. God will watch over you. And he will execute judgment on your adversaries, both in the end and as well as in the right now. Now, the judgment on the unrighteous at the end of days, that's certainly one way that God executes judgment on your adversaries. The other is God has arrayed a spiritual defense against uh, the powers of hell who want to take you out of play. Have you ever had an experience where you thought, boy, if it wasn't for the grace of God, I wouldn't be here now? Almost everyone I know has a story like that, where you really shouldn't be alive today, but God had mercy on you. By the way, I want to give a, a little report for our friend Steve Weatherford, who is off the ventilator. It's a miracle in itself. He is uh, off of the medicines that had him medically paralyzed. He is responding uh, not as well as they'd like to physical therapy, but it's coming. His oxygen levels are much better. He's on a CPAP now only at night for a while. Uh, he's awake during the day. He gets to talk on the phone. Uh, he is so much recovered from what he was a week ago. He's on the ventilator for nine days, and COVID patients don't usually get off a ventilator. He still has some fluid in his lungs, but they're treating him for that to try to get rid of the fluid and the pneumonia. But he is recovering so wonderfully that it's absolutely a miracle of God that he's even still alive. So God has spared him. I'm just telling you all that to say God is a spiritual defense for those who want to take you out of play. His ministry has been lifelong to sing the gospel. Did it with his family. His father died in the mid-90s. His mother sang until about 10 years ago, maybe less than that, probably five or six years ago. She's uh, 92 later this month, later next month. And uh, Steve has sung, I sang with the Weatherfords when he was five years old. So he's been at this a while. I think he's 58. So may the Lord continue to raise him up and as a witness of God's wonderful power of recovery. But there is a spiritual array of wickedness in high places, defenses of the devil, those powers and principalities who are south, uh, set out to destroy you and or me. But they cannot be successful until God decides to take you home. You're not done until God says you're done. So God defends you. He goes before you. And he cleans up, by the way, after you too sometimes. The Bible says he'll be my front guard, he'll be my rear guard. God guards over us. That's the point I'm making. We have confidence in the Lord concerning you, both that you do and will do the things we command you. I see here a, that Paul has a shared confidence in the Lord working in them. I'm getting dizzy. <laughs> and them cooperating with the work of God in them. So I just want to just say, God works in you. But it's wisdom for you to cooperate with the Word of God and the work of God in you. God wants to work in you. God wants to work through you. Cooperate with him. You ever find yourself um, not wanting to? <laughs> Lord, I don't like this lesson. I'd rather not do this. I'd rather not have to deal with that. You ever notice God lets things come up to show you you're not all that? Tick me off yesterday. I really wanted to write that thing on Facebook really bad. And I thought, no, it'd be more important that I respond the way I should. I didn't do very well, but public confession is good for the soul, I guess. I'm almost done here. And then the phrase, the things we command you, I, I just want to talk about that for a second. Paul is writing, and he understands that those are commands because he got those commands from the Lord Jesus to give to the church. Paul had revelation from God. So when he writes these things, he's first of all, he's spoken to them. And then he's writing to them to remind them of what he has said. And these are commands from the Lord. This is how the Christians should live their life. It's how the Christian church should look. We don't command anyone. God's word still is the commands that we obey. You notice when you read the Bible, it presses you. No, I didn't say depress you. When you read the Bible, it presses you, presses you to a decision, pushes you toward an action, compelling you to make a decision about what you have read. Here's a book over 2,000 years old that God is still leaning on people with it. 
Why? Because it's the word of the living God. It's full of truth and full of grace. And when God speaks, you know he's talking right to you. He's challenging your mindset. He's challenging the rebellious factor in your heart that's deep within every one of us. God is saying, look, I want to redeem you from that. I want you to be my people. I want you to live like me. I want you to act like me. God's rules aren't optional. Don't you sometimes wish they were? Ah, I can take it or leave it. No, you can't. 1 John chapter 2. Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. <laughs> I love that one. You'll get somebody who will tell you how you're supposed to live the Christian life. They aren't living it, but they sure know how you're supposed to. And I just say, well, excuse me, how many of the commands of the Lord are you keeping? This is how I know you know God. You keep his commandments. Oh, this is how I know you don't. And then verse 5, look at that, we're almost done here. Now may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. Direct means to guide straight towards or upon something, or to guide or direct one's way or journey to a place. So if you wanted to go from A to B and it involves C and Q and Z and R, you would need directions how to get there. And it says that he is praying that God will direct them. God will take you through your life experiences, but you will be directed by the Lord. You've read the verse in the Old Testament that the steps of a righteous man are directed by the Lord. You can rest assured that God is taking you somewhere. Your life's decisions, your journey is described by God as on purpose. God is taking you somewhere because along the way, those experiences will challenge you to decide to become more like God or not, depending on your choices. But God wants to take you where you're supposed to go. And then I'm going to end it up with this, the patience of Christ. Now, I, I think there's two ways this could be taken. One is you could just patiently wait for Christ to appear, and I think we should. Don't be anxious. Uh, all of this, too, will someday pass. Either that or you will pass. Either way, we get out of here. But I think it means this. We should be like Jesus who was patient in his waiting for his fulfillment. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Hebrews 12, starting at verse 2. I'm reading from the Living Bible. Keep your eyes on Jesus, our leader and instructor. He was willing to die a shameful death on the cross because of the joy he knew would be his afterwards. And now he sits in the place of honor by the throne of God. If you want to become... If you want to keep, excuse me, if you want to keep from becoming faint-hearted and weary, think about his patience as sinful men did such terrible things to him. After all, you have never yet struggled against sin and temptation until you sweat great drops of blood. So your struggle against sin hasn't cost you much, really. A little guilty conscience from time to time, right? A little confrontation, perhaps, somebody jerking the slack out of your chain. But God can do that better than anybody, right? You've never had God jerk the slack out of your chain? Come see me. I'll see if I can help. I'm just here to help. And may the Lord guide your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. There is a reward waiting for you and me who patiently await the coming of the Lord. Jesus is coming back. Now, we may never again know peace in this life. You know the political climate in which we live. In less than two weeks, uh, a week and a couple of days, have you thought about what the world is going to look like? Do you have water <laughs> stored up? I heard a politician who was running for high office say recently, and he said this with great conviction. 
Americans don't panic. Excuse me, do you remember when you couldn't buy toilet paper? <laughs> Americans don't panic? We may never again know peace in this life, but it doesn't matter. You should just learn what matters. What matters? I know what matters to me. You need to decide what matters. Stick with that. Decide what matters. I'm really grateful that you've decided to follow Jesus. You know the old chorus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back. No turning back. Deciding what matters. Lord Jesus, you matter most. Help us, Lord, to ascertain by your word, by your honest, unfiltered, blood-washed, conscience, what matters. Help us, Lord, to be simple and pure before you, unspotted from the world, washed white as snow with the precious blood of Jesus who loved us, gave himself for us. Lord, may your power infuse your saints. May we be a witness to this world of what it means to put our trust in the true and living God. Thank you, Lord, that you loved us, you have saved us, you are keeping us, you heal us, you deliver us, and someday you will come and get us. Lord, we thank you and we bless your name today. We bless your church around the world. Lord, we pray for those who are in authority, that you would open the eyes so that their blindness would leave. Lord, your word says that even the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. So, Lord, we pray for there to be a lifting of these sanctions that the... Uh, country could again work, that the church would again be free, but if that never happens, Lord, may we spread your gospel without fear, without being intimidated, with great boldness, with great kindness, with great love and great passion, but with great authority and great confidence that you will confirm your word with the work of the Holy Ghost. Lord, may your people be full of your spirit to the praise of your name and the advance of your kingdom. We pray all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Amen.